Our first guest on this episode is Karen Shimoda, the president of QP1404. Karen, welcome to the episode. Thank you. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about what the workers at 1404 do, because I know that when I look at your, your website, you're specifically 1404-6. So from a broader perspective, tell me a bit about 1404 and then your specific bargaining unit or your specific local. Great. Thank you. So 1404 is a composite local. We have uh, five homes and three of them are long-term care and two of them are retirement. Uh, specifically, we're looking at Amica Dundas right now. We're in bargaining and it's uh, a retirement home. Okay, so Amica Dundas, people probably, if they've driven through downtown Dundas, have driven past it a whole bunch of times, maybe not even realized what it was or, or if it was there. Sometimes you drive past retirement homes these days and it's hard to tell. It just look, sometimes looks like a big house, sometimes it looks like a bigger building. Um, tell me a little bit about what the issues that you're facing right now are because I know that oftentimes we hear about you know uh, people who are going into collective bargaining and there's sometimes a vote for a strike and strike action it's been a bit of a longer process for you at this point I think it has and uh, so currently we're bargaining our second collective agreement they're fairly uh, new to being unionized um, and their first collective was a five-year term so that was long to live under those uh, conditions and now that it's been expired for over a year we started bargaining um, last year and we had three face-to-face -face dates with the employer um, and unfortunately didn't get very far and then in January we had our first uh, conciliation date um, and we're hoping that they will come back to the table to bargain with us but so far, they have not. So, the conciliation date back in January, it's already going. It's already going into May, and that's a long time to wait between dates. And even before then, having a, tell me a little bit about what kind of what different job classes do you have within um, Amica? In other words, uh, inside the facility, is it just one big job class, or is it different different groups doing different things? Oh, we have multiple groups. We have the RPNs, the PSWs, the all the food service workers, the housekeepers, uh, maintenance. Uh, recreation like activity aids, dishwashers, um, the whole, it, it really mimics what you would see in long-term care. I know the shock whenever I go out and I speak with, I speak with presidents from different unions who represent either retirement homes or long-term care facilities and it always shocks me at how little in terms of wages and salaries in some cases that we pay workers who are there to take care of our parents, our grandparents, and we like to think that we're giving them the best care possible. It's really tough to give them the best care possible when the workers who work in there sometimes have to work two or three jobs just to get by. That, that's exactly the problem and we saw that uh, specifically through COVID uh, when lots of workers had two or three jobs and the ministry directives came down that you could only work for one home and lots of those workers then went to other other jobs because their wages were so low in retirement. So give me a brief breakdown what the what the big difference between a retirement home and a long-term care facility is because I think a lot of times people who don't necessarily know the difference will just call everything a retirement home because that's the common nomenclature obviously there's a difference but then I also I, I know already I'm gonna follow up with this talking about why aren't some of those barriers between the two being respected anymore but certainly if we can explain just the difference between the two to start well I think the big difference is uh, long-term care has really changed over the last 20 years. Um, there was a time when you couldn't live in a long-term care facility unless you could walk through the front doors. Um, and that really changed. My understanding of it was back in the 80s when um, Mike Harris and all the cuts and the, and the beds were all, lots of smaller homes closed and lots of folks ended up in long-term care. And those beds are so um, hard to come by that retirement homes sort of grabbed onto that opportunity and they created areas in their homes called memory care for instance uh, where where folks can move in who have dementia Alzheimer's um, m exactly like you would see in long-term care uh, and so retirement isn't just grandma and grandpa who are able to move in and take care of themselves um, they're moving in already in a state where they need more care than what retirement home implies. And so there's a lot of blurring of the lines these days more than there probably ever has been in the past. How does that impact the residents who are there? The residents who are there, if they're in what's called a retirement home, from what I understand, they end up paying for almost everything. Every little extra thing they pay for, whereas that might not necessarily be the case in long-term care. That's exactly right, and we sort of call that a la carte because if, uh, if I live in a retirement home and I pay 
and I'll just say $8,000 a month, it could be much more than that, um, and I need a Band-Aid for my finger, and I go to a staff member for a Band-Aid, they call that a dressing, and they charge me $5 for that. That's not the case in long-term care, and I think the biggest difference really is that it's for-profit. Retirement homes are for-profit homes. Yeah, and that's, I can't imagine the ongoing um, the ongoing mental health and stress issues that that must, must cause for the workers as well. When you've got residents who are there who are paying six thousand, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars, and maybe you're getting to the point where they can't afford to pay that, and now you're representing the employer, you know, as walking in there as a staff member and saying it's going to cost you this much for this, this much for this, and this much for this, that has to put a stress on your workers on an ongoing basis. It, it breaks their hearts because yeah. they have close, intimate relationships with the residents. Um, they care for them 24 hours a day. And it hurts them to have to charge them, for instance, they charge um, to put socks on and take socks off at the end of the day. If you can't do that for yourself, and a PSW does that, uh, you pay for that extra. And often the staff won't chart that because they don't want the resident to be charged those extra fees when it's already costing them so much. And with their wages being low, it also impacts the residents. They, they feel really bad that the staff, they know they're paying a lot of money and they know the workers aren't making a very high wage and that also makes them, they feel very sad and they say that. Why are, why are your wages so low? Why aren't you make? we pay so much to live here. Um, and so there is a high turnover in staff. And that reflects on resident care when it's always, you know, folks coming in and out. They don't stay, some of them stay, but not, not for very long. Right. Now, my wife is a, a long-term care nurse uh, in a long-term care facility here in Hamilton, and she often tells me that part of the rules that came down during the pandemic regarding working short, for instance, because people were getting sick, you would have to often operate on a skeleton crew, you couldn't necessarily get by. She still will tell me that oftentimes to this day, uh, that her, at her facility, they will work short and run shifts short almost all the time. And that has become a huge issue because it puts more and more and more job stress on the people who are there. I'm assuming that's happening within retirement homes as it, well. It sure is. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, working short is, a, is daily. Um, and it's because the recruitment and certainly the retention is, is a big problem. Yeah. So, I, I mean, are there times where I'm guessing that your members would maybe even have to report, you know, or it's just unsafe to be in there with the number of people that are in there, with some of the crossover duties that they're doing in terms of a long-term care and, 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 uh, and care for residents, that you might just not have enough people in there and they are calling in, what, agency people to come in and do this and paying them three times the amount. Exactly. Lots yeah. of agency workers. Yeah. And agency workers, for people who don't know, um, you know, an agency worker gets paid three times the amount, and if you just paid your workers maybe a little bit more, sure. they would be able to come in. Uh, right. Talk to me a little bit about what are some of the things that your workers are looking for as part of this bargaining process. Obviously, we know that wages are obviously a big important part to keep up with the cost of living and the cost of inflation and to be able to just go to the grocery store. I mean, sure. Um, sure. but what are some of the things that people might not think about necessarily? Um, I think a big one is benefits and, yeah. and wrapped up in, there's a, a lot packaged in benefits, but um, the big one is sick days. Yeah. So um, if I'm a full-timer at Amica Dundas, I get six paid sick days. And if I'm part-time, I get three. Um, through the pandemic, we certainly saw that lots of workers got sick with COVID-19 mm. and six sick days is not enough, not nearly enough to, uh, to be able to stay home and be sick. Sure. Um, when, another concern that I hear from around retirement long-term care facilities is the increasing incidences of violence, especially when you have, we, honestly, we have generations living longer than they ever have before. And when people get things like Alzheimer's and dementia, it's beyond their control, but that doesn't mean that there's not violence happening in the workplace. Is that a prominent issue, and is it a growing issue? In it certainly is. As well? it, it really is, and it's harder and harder to um, provide um, the training and um, have people well equipped to be able to handle, especially in retirement. I think long-term care manages that a, a little better, but it is an increasing issue in the homes. I, and I know that in some of those cases, it's like, well, we'll provide you with, you know, personal protective equipment. But I mean, some, no worker wants to walk around in like, you know, Kevlar sleeves or, or bibs and stuff like that on a day to day basis. That's, that's something that gets more and more complicated. Um, I'm curious, as you're moving forward now with Amica, and we've got, like you said, past conciliation to the point where there hasn't, 
What are some of your next moves? Obviously, you had a rally a couple of weeks ago, and there was a great turnout there. We did. So how do we keep applying pressure, uh, especially, and I will say this, if people are listening and watching, and they are, they have maybe family that is at Amica, and they recognize that the workers should be respected more and should get paid more, what is some of the pressure that can be applied? Uh, well, we do have an online petition that we would ask folks to sign, yep. um, and we're hoping to have about 500 signatures by June, so that's certainly, yep. we're at about 150 signatures right now, so we should be able to get there easily. Um, you could please reach out to your MPPs, Sandy Shaw, Alex Wilson in Dundas, um, have been supportive. Um, we do have an interest arbitration date coming in September. And we're hoping before that that the employer will reach out and come back to the table. Yeah, arbitrations obviously everybody knows are risky. You, you That's know, right. one side proposes one, the other side proposes something else, and if you don't end up in the middle, you end up on one side or the other. It could be very, very risky. We would rather them come back to the bargaining table, and they uh, did say at the rally that they were eager to come back to the table, but we haven't heard anything at all from them. Well, exactly. I remember I saw the press. Re I saw the press release after from them. Oh yeah, we're totally interested in coming back to the table, but it's already two weeks later, and mm -hmm. as president, haven't you haven't heard anything. Haven't heard a word. It's, uh, it's, it's just a shame. Uh, by all means, uh, best of luck to your members. Uh, you know that there's a lot of support out in the city for you. You know that we're a union town here in Hamilton. And uh, as the more that you call out, the more that I think people are going to come in. So thanks for coming on the episode Excellent. this week. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll be right back after this.